Lauren, one of the things you said at the end of your podcast was that you really like CGM technology and you are glad that it exists and you think it's a huge step forward for people in the, you know, who are monitoring their blood glucose. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, you know what? I want to feel the same way as you. I really do. I want to be all positive about the fact that CGMs exist and that people are getting a lot of value out of them, and especially for people who are living with diabetes. Um, but like the contrast is that my own personal experience with it has been just frustrating. So the first thing that I'll say here is that um, I th- the, I've been thinking long and hard about what is it that like really frustrates me at, its, at, at my core. And I think the number one biggest frustration for me is the fact that the I'm, I'm using a Freestyle Libre 3. So that's the most recent Abbott product, the Freestyle Libre. They had the two and then they recently released the three. And I was given access to that. My insurance company did not give me access to use the Dexcom G6 or the G7. And that's ultimately what I wanted to use because I knew and I had heard that there's the Dexcom is actually more accurate than the Freestyle. But I said, you know what? It's okay. Um, you know, I'll try out the freestyle, see what happens. Um, what I have come to learn over the course of the last two months using it is that the Libre 3 can be up to 20% inaccurate. 20% inaccurate. And at first, on paper, you're like, okay, whatever, it's 20%. Who cares about 20%? It's not a big deal. But then as I started using it and started recognizing what does 20% actually mean, I was shocked, like literally shocked that you can have a device that had to go through human clinical trials and is an FDA-approved class two medical device that has billions of dollars of research behind it. And yet, when I'm checking my blood glucose, I'll get a reading on the CGM of 196 with a straight arrow going up. But then when I check my blood glucose on my blood glucose meter, it's 151. And I'm sitting here looking at the two of them and I'm like, 196 versus 151? I know the right answer is 151 because that's my blood glucose. You take a look at the CGM and it's 40 something points off, right? That's about 20%, right? Now, if that was just a one-time thing, all right, fine, no big deal, I'll give it to you. But what I have done over the course of the last two months is take Logist, realistically 150 different blood glucose checks to see how close the blood glucose meter is versus the CGM. And the closest agreement that I could get between the two of those devices is 15 points. So either the Libre is 15 points above or 15 points below what the blood glucose uh, meter is reading. And the largest difference is about 45 points. And there seems to be no correlation between, you know, I, there's no way for me to know if I can trust the number that's coming off of the CGM, right? And that's frustrating. That's really frustrating because as I've been using it, I'm sort of thinking to myself like, man, are there other things in this world that are that inaccurate, right? Like the analogy that I think to myself is like, imagine you're driving down the road in your car And you look at your speedometer and your speedometer was 20% 20 inaccurate, right? So you get pulled over by a police officer. The police officer goes, hey, excuse me, sir, do you know how fast you were driving? And your answer to him is, well, I'm somewhere between 40 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour, but I'm not really sure because I can't trust my speedometer, right? That's a big difference, right? Or here's another silly analogy. Like imagine if the gas gauge in your car was 20% inaccurate, right? You know, it's like halfway, it says it's a half of a tank. And you're like, well, I don't know, maybe there's a fourth of a tank. Maybe there's a three quarters of a tank. I don't really know. I'm not sure when I'm supposed to go to the freaking gas station anymore, right? Um, or my best analogy here is imagine if your bank balance was 20% inaccurate, right? You go and you deposit $1,000 into your bank account. And then the next time you check your balance, the balance could be as low as $800 or as high as $1,200. And your bank's like, oh, I'm sorry, we're 20% inaccurate. Uh, you know, check back with us, right? So like, I understand that this thing's not going to be 100% accurate all the time, but we're in 2024 for heaven's sakes. And this is a device that has a lot of money and a lot of technology behind it. I personally expect much closer than 20%. I want it to be something like 5% accurate or inaccurate. And if it was that level of accuracy, I would be much happier. You guys tell me, am I just being too neurotic? No. Can I tell you about a study, Cyrus? 
Hit me. All right. 2024. Hmm. Yep. Okay. I couldn't, I was so excited when I found, I was so excited when I found this because I did not know, you know, reading this was like watching an exciting movie. Like, how is it going to end? Where are we going to go with this? And it's finally something that came out comparing the Dexcom G7, which is their newest model, and Abbott's Libre 3, which is their newest model. It came out in January. So we're just a couple months out from this, which is really cool. Got my hands on this right away. And I've had my own uh, studies on this where I compared, I think I was on either Libre 1 and 2, and I compared it with the G6 at one point in time and really kind of wavered between which was more accurate. As someone who's active, I thought the G6 was a better option. That's just personal story and, and how that worked. So what's interesting about this study, and I'll just give you a couple tidbits because I have a feeling you're going to want to look at this much closer than what I'm going to give you right now. But yes, they mentioned the plus or minus, the 20% variability, that that is what they're finding between both systems. And that to them in their business world and the FDA approval world is certainly acceptable, which is really interesting because the Libre technology has been around since the early 2000s. They put these on a couple of bike racers that raced across America back in 2007. They were testing this model before that. And that's how I got really turned on to sensors and activity as I read about these bike racers and I wanted to get my hands on this tech. So it's been a while. They've been working on this and it's still not accurate with every single sensor. So currently the sensor I'm on has been pretty accurate, quite honestly. And I've had some, I've had a tricky week on my hands. The sensor that you've been on most recently, you want to rip it off your arm and throw it out the window. Well, they're going to take an average of those two and then they're going to go, eh, well, they're looking pretty good. So as we go through this study, what I find to be amazing is they specifically called out that when they did not track sensor accuracy, was when blood glucose was rapidly rising or rapidly falling. And if you live with type 1 diabetes, that is the most critical time to have accuracy, especially if you've been on a bike and you're 30 miles from home or you're in the middle of a three-mile jog or you're brand new to this life and you need to know the difference here and you want to feel safe. So trust, of course, is a very valid feeling and reaction and the lack of mistrust. So as I'm going through this, I go, okay, so which one's more accurate? What's, what's the, what's the end? What's the punchline here? here? Right. What's the line? So they concluded that the Freestyle Libre 3 was more accurate than the G7. Oh, the expression on your face. I'm seeing some body what? language. Stars. Okay. Yep. It was more accurate. Now, I get to the very bottom of the study because I'm always curious about, you know, what else are we citing here? How large was the study? Let me just recap and look at the conclusion. But don't ever stop there if you're reading a study. Go all the way down. And guess who designed and funded the study? Abbott, my friend. <gasps> Of course they, were the they ones did. Who did it. Yeah, of course. And not okay. to say, right, like not to say this is all wrong. Clearly, this is a clinical trial. We're looking at the data here, but it's been published. And they're, you know, that's where I'm always curious about what else is going on because anecdotally, we talk to people that are on all kinds of different systems and we have to work with people on a very individual basis with sensors. That's why I have a love hate relationship with them. That's where we talked about the habits and being able to trust yourself if you think that that data that you're getting this generating from the sensor is goofy is being able to stop and say, mm, 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 no, no, no. I'm going to trust myself in this situation and troubleshoot and move on. Wow. That's fascinating. Actually. Um, it brings up the point here that, you know, a couple of things. Number one, when you're reading a research paper, always take a look at the funding sources always, because there could be a conflict of interest. And that actually is happening more and more and more in the research world. And if you don't read that, then you can just sort of interpret the results at face value. Oftentimes, even if the data says a particular thing, the conclusion of the paper is an interpretation by a human being. And so sometimes the interpretation can have a little bit of a twist on it, depending on who actually funded the study and who wanted to put dollars behind it. So that's a really good point. If we go back to just thinking about accuracy as a general idea, right? Imagine 20% accuracy as being the difference. If you're living with type 2 diabetes, okay, a 20% inaccuracy is the difference between 
a blood glucose that's technically in range, which is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, okay, versus a fasting blood glucose that's out of range and higher than 100 blood, uh, milligrams per deciliter. In other words, if you're living with type 2 diabetes and your goal is to try and keep your blood glucose under 100 and you check your blood glucose meter and you see the numbers are 92, you're going to take a giant sigh of relief. You're going to be like, oh, okay, cool. Things are moving in the right direction. But if you add 20% inaccuracy on top of that, now you check your blood glucose using a CGM and instead of reading a 92, it could read 117. Okay? That's the difference between you having a really ideal blood glucose measurement first thing in the morning and knowing that you're moving in the right direction and then also checking your blood glucose afterwards and being like, why isn't this program working? How come this diet isn't working? How come exercise isn't working? And before you know it, you start to point a finger at all the other things that you're trying to do and then you're like, well, maybe I should switch over to doing something different when in reality, all of it was just boiling down to the fact that the device you're using is not accurate enough. And then for people who are living with type 1 diabetes like you and me, Lauren, I mean, uh, the difference between, <laughs> you know, a 40-point difference in, your, in, in a blood glucose reading is, is very challenging because I know you're not supposed to make a decision about injecting insulin based only off of a CGM reading. They tell you that in very big, bold letters. They say, if you're going to inject insulin, please check your blood glucose using a blood glucose meter. Okay, fine. I'll give that to you. I get it right? But what is the point of wearing, like if somebody living with type 1 diabetes who has to inject insulin anywhere from, I don't know, one, two, three, four, call it four times a day at the minimum, upwards of like six times a day, depending how, how often you eat food, okay? If I have to use a, a test strip every single time I'm going to make an insulin dosing decision, and I'm wearing a CGM simultaneously, then I'm basically using two different technologies that don't agree with each other to try and educate me about what I'm supposed to do with my blood glucose, what I'm supposed to do when I'm injecting insulin. Okay? So that can become a little bit annoying because now all of a sudden I have two devices. I have my cell phone open. I'm looking at this number. I'm like, okay, let me look at this trend over here. And then I have my blood glucose meter and I'm like, okay, I think this is the right answer. And this is off by a little bit. So what am I supposed to do? And this is showing an up arrow and this doesn't show any arrow. And, uh, you know, and then at a certain point I'm like, well, now that means that I have to have a blood glucose meter with a prescription for test strips. And that can add up in cost in addition to the cost of the actual sensor for the, for the continuous glucose monitor. And so there were many times within the last two months where I'm sitting here with two devices trying to make sense of the two of them in order to make an intelligent decision about what I'm going to do for insulin. And then I'm sitting here and I'm like, why am I doing this to myself? I could just turn off the CGM and say, you know what, CGM, you're just giving me problems and you're making me mentally frustrated and I will just trust the blood glucose meter because it is the right answer. So if I have the right answer in front of me, then why am I looking to another device to try and give me another right answer that's only going to frustrate me, okay? That's my experience, but again, like maybe I'm just overthinking this. You, you tell me if you guys have any different ideas on this. <laughs> 